Would you join me in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Mark? Mark chapter six. <laughs> I'll get right to the point. <laughs> well, let's see now. May I, let me uh, let me start the morning with, if I may, a poem. A poem. Made it up myself. But I think, I think it's, it's, it, it's biblical. It, it uh, paints a picture of an event from the perspective of one of the 12. <clears throat> and I think it, there's, a real, there's a real sense in which all of us, like them, we... We go through these things where we, you, we think we know the Lord, we've got some things figured out, and then we go through things that reveal more of him to us, and he's more than we ever imagined. And it just keeps happening. And I expect it will keep happening forever. It'll never end. But imagine one of them telling the story like this. We really thought we knew him. As we answered his call and we followed, a mismatched band of men were we sailing off into tomorrow. I never knew a man to work so hard and to spend himself like him. And at last I saw him finally lay down as all light was growing dim and, and the darkness came as did the wind. And that lake, it became a beast that howled and roared and reached for us thirteen mortals for its feast. Everything I believed suddenly seemed like a lie. Nothing made any sense as waves of terror swept over my soul. Each one was even more intense. I felt my way to the back of that boat to where I had seen him lay. And so human was he that in his fatigue and despite the pounding waves, he slept. Like a man unaware there was any reason for fear. Like one who knew just where he was going and what he was doing here. Then this angry thought broke through my fear as my panic reached its peak and it erupted out as this hostile question that I could not help but speak. We are going to die, I cried out loud to the one who led us there. You said let's go over, but we're going under. Then how is it that you don't care? And at first he said nothing. But he seemed to be struggling with a mind not fully awakened, brought straight from his dream right into our nightmare. Still, he wasn't the least bit shaken. He stood up suddenly, and he steadied himself. With one hand he held to the ropes, like, like holding the reins of a stallion. He rode that rising and falling boat, one hand on the ropes and one hand in the air, while we cowered along the sides. He confronted the beast caused us to cower, so frightened and so terrified. And the words that he spoke were not a request. <laughs> they were not a victim's plea. His words were not louder than the howl of the wind or the roar of Galilee. But his words, they carried power, undeniable power, that even the force of the wind had to flee, mightier than the thunder of great waters mightier than the breakers of the sea. He spoke to that storm like it was a dog. And his command muzzled its jaw and it fled with its tail tucked in its legs while we huddled in silence and awe. <laughs> Everything was quiet upon hearing his words. The water, the earth, the sky, but none were as silent and speechless as we who had just witnessed this with our eyes. This man who took lordship over nature, for whom nature humbly complied, then turned his gaze upon us, little men, just beginning to slowly rise. Why were you frightened, he asked us. And how is it that you have no faith? We had no answer to give him. Looking back, we can only say that we were afraid of all that was against us because we did not realize what manner of men it was that we followed and trusted with our very lives. Now, we had no 
answer to his question of us. But we had questions of our own. And one of us finally spoke those words that still echo in my soul. What manner of man indeed is he? And that is still more than I can even know. In the sixth chapter of Mark, we have the record of the Lord feeding a multitude. It begins in Mark chapter 6, verse 30. It says, And the apostles gathered, the, themsel they gathered themselves together unto Jesus, and he told them all things, both, <laughs> they told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart unto a desert place and rest a while. That invitation from the Lord. Come aside. Let's, let's get out of here. They'd been out. They sent them out in pairs. They did ministry. And he invited them. Let's go get alone. Let's go somewhere. Let's take a break. He says, for there were many coming and going and they had no leisure so much as to eat. Needs of people. The needs of humanity kept them busy. They were so busy, so busy. Only a mom can relate. They're so busy, you don't even have time to eat. You just got to get a bite when you can. In between, meeting those needs. They departed into a desert place uh, by ship privately. They discreetly, <laughs> they thought, quite privately, without an announcement. They went to another place place on the shore of that lake where there was no houses, there were no, there's no village, and there's no people. They went quite privately, but verse 33 says, and the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran a foot thither out of all cities, and out went them, and came together unto them. So the multitude looked at the trajectory of that boat, and met them there on foot. They were eager. Well, it's that 34th verse in Jesus when he came out. When he came out. He came out of the boat. He came to the land. This desert place, this deserted place was not so deserted. He saw much people and he was moved with compassion toward them because they were as sheep not having a shepherd. He began to teach them many things. So he just went to work. When he is working, teaching them, the disciples are free. There's nothing for them to be doing. He doesn't need an amen corner. He doesn't need anybody to hype the crowd, as is commonly practiced in America now. That's that Stephen Furtick trick, gimmick. All you got to do is say, open your Bible. woo They go hysterical. Somebody's hyping that up. There are churches that got hype men. Like it's a variety show with a live audience. You got to warm that crowd up. You got to get them to. And you got signs that say applaud. <laughs> well, the churches don't necessarily have signs that say applaud. But there are nevertheless cues. Now the Lord doesn't have any such need. He doesn't have uh, a promotional team. He doesn't have, there's no marketing happening. He's just him. It's just his teaching, his miracles, his power, drawing such a crowd. Hmm. I'm a, don't get me wrong. I, there's certainly nothing wrong with being a good inviter, with, with reaching out and trying to bring people together. I, I, that's, that's wonderful. But there are, come on, you guys know. There are things being done now. There are things that look like from a distance uh, they're a move of God. They're not. They're mass marketing and production. All of that Hillsong phenomenon was nothing but very effective production. That's all it was. Might as well just be a, a big music venue, a big sort of music agency focusing on it. It's, it's not a movement of God. There, there are many things that want to call themselves a movement just because they're a massive gathering, and maybe a, a massive crowd caught up in a, a lot of emotion, but it's all done through very effective marketing. The Welshman, Leonard Ravenhill said in Why Revival Terriers? It's a really simple sentence. He just said, you never have to advertise a fire. 
You don't have to advertise a fire. People come. Big landmark in, my t in, in Bangor, Maine. Uh, 14th year of my life, I came out of a movie theater on Main Street. And I just saw a lot of commotion in, you know, downtown Main Street. And a lot of people all moving in one direction. They all seemed to have a look on their face like something was happening. I followed that crowd. And the 200-year-old St. Mary's Church was burning down. We, we were all drawn to it. A big fire like that. Nobody went out with invita uh, invitations. Nobody went out with, you know, fly. There was no, there was no marketing. You don't have to advertise an event like that. You don't, you don't have to advertise. There's nothing wrong with advertising. Nothing wrong with inviting. But th my point here is that the disciples were not busy. They were free. The Lord was working. I have contempt for the, the wussy pastor, wimp pastor that acts like, when Monday comes, I am just so spent. I have, I have met them. Some of them are my friends, and I'm ashamed of them. I'm, so, I'm ashamed of them. What do you do? All, you talked all day. Oh, poor you. Have you never had a real job? A real job. And I paid the bills on the end of a chainsaw up in the treetops. Feeding chippers and moving wood. And at the end of the day, you really did physically experience what it is to be spent. I have the scars. I, I bear the marks of that trade. I had a 60-stitch zipper over here, another 40 on this leg. Um, it, was a, it was man's work. It was. It was, <laughs> it, was, it was high adventure. I just can't imagine anybody getting all dramatic How about having to talk, having to speak. It's invigorating. I, don't, I, I can't relate. To the guy who goes, I just don't answer my phone. I have to get away. <laughs> anyway, you know, the, the Lord is teaching. The Lord is, he is, he is feeding hungry hearts, and it's, it's truly in, invigorating for him. He sat down, and he taught them. All of that was unnecessary, and I ate up a lot of time. <laughs> but he was moved with compassion. Compassion moved him. They were like sheep without a shepherd. Is there anything so vulnerable? I tell you that all the foolish things that the world believes right now, the state religion is evolution. Evolution is a stupid lie. And it originated in the heart of Lucifer. I will ascend. Oh, no, you won't. No, no one ascends. There's no ascension. I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. No, you won't. He sold that lie to our parents. Evolution. There is no explanation in evolution. Where supposedly the mechanism is natural selection, the law is the survival of the fittest. Tell me, how does anything live long enough to get fit? If it ain't fit, it's dead. Sounds like it has to get here fit. Anyway, so... There's no explanation for the existence of sheep in the survival of the fitness arrangement. In a world where everything is at war, predator versus prey, and God has equipped everything. Every creature is equipped. The, the predator has its gear. The prey has its gear, including its very important 360-degree vision, eyes mounted on the side of its head, because it has to be. But in the genius of God, the variety of life forms, everything from body armor to quills on the porcupine. Which, by the way, porcupines mate. <laughs> I'll say no more. Just figure that one out. The genius of God. They get it, they get it done. They're still porcupines. The wonder of what he has created, the genius of God. Everything is equipped. Camouflage, jet propulsion, illusion. There, God even creates actors, like the possum. Actors, 
who pretend it's an amazing thing. Even the skunk has stink going for him, right? What does sheep have? Fuzz. They got nothing. There is no reason that sheep should exist. There's no evolutionary explanation for their existence. Without a shepherd, they are food. You can't get any lower than the bottom of the food chain. They don't even have the superpower that the mouse has of, you know, <laughs> massive reproduction. Without shepherds, there's no sheep. What a, what a statement. The, the, the Lord looked at the multitudes, and he's talking about multitudes of men and women, our kind, and he saw them. And he saw it and went, oh, they're like sheep without a shepherd. Helpless, clueless, aimless. He was moved. He was moved with compassion. So he sat down and taught them. He, t- he began to teach them many things. Verse 35, when the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him, and they came unto him and said, this is a desert place. Like he didn't know that. He invited them there. This is a desert place. And now the time is far past. Send them away that they may go into the country round about and into the villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. This is common, I suppose, for us, our stupid kind. It's common for us to seek to advise God or to pretend that we're more concerned or more aware of human need than God is. God in the flesh. They interrupted him. I'd just like you to take note of that. <clears throat> like you're, <clears throat> you're going too long. The crowd is still there, right? By the way, there's an old rabbinical saying that the rabbi should leave before the crowd. In other words, the crowd starts peeling off. You've missed a whole lot of good stopping points, clearly. But they're still there. The crowd remains. The rabbi should leave, leave before the, teach, the students. The rabbi should leave first. Well, send them away. They have nothing to eat. He answered them and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. Then I, what's not written right here by Mark, as he relates what Peter told him, is the long, stupid look, the long, awkward pause. He goes, you, you feed them. <laughs> they stood there looking dumb. You've seen that before. You've seen your children wandering around. And what are you looking for? My shoes. Go find them. And she's standing there looking at you like the shoes are going to jump out or their socks or their foam, right? <laughs> My dear wife, I always tell Jeanette, you are always, everyone, habits are either going to be your cruelest masters or your best servants. You are always either reinforcing or developing a new habit. Well, her habits with regard to her cell phone, she just, every day. Has anybody seen my phone? Has anybody seen my phone? Could you call my phone? I hear this every day. For years, since the invention of the cell phone. And then she tells me she wants to get a concealed carry permit. (laughs) And I said, no, I think not. (laughs) Yes, I am. No, you're not. I say, yeah, no, I don't want to hear. Has anybody seen my gun? <laughs> that ended that argument. She laughed and agreed. <laughs> then I got her an Apple Watch. I got her, I got her an Apple Watch because I, I was told, I'm real low tech, but I was told that she can find her phone with that thing. <laughs> and maybe she could tape her, d- her gun to it, the phone. <laughs> anyway, I was told, and also, it, you know, she... She's got some heart issues, and I said, well, this, you know, the guys at the store told me this one will monitor your heart rate, your blood oxygen level, and your movements, you know, through the day. She goes, oh, what? She was real excited about it. She got her Apple Watch, and right away, it was creeping her out because it's talking to her. No, nah! like you've been sitting too long. Get up and move. Who do you think you are? She said, she's taking offense. That is creepy. How does it know how long I've been sitting? She, she's really freaking out about this. And then she really freaked out. When she's riding in, she's on her way to church. She got all kinds of, you know, things going on with her health, her back and stuff. And she looks at her phone, and it says, what hurts the most? Ah! And she said, God doesn't know anything hurts, and where do I begin? 
She had all this stuff going on. She was really creeped out and ready to rip it off. But she realized that's actually part of a playlist. It's a Rascal Flat song. And <laughs> it, was on the, it was on the Apple CarPlay thing. What hurts the most, turns out, is being so close and having so much to say and watching you walk away and never knowing. Anyway, <laughs> what might have been. <laughs> I said, well, shame on you for listening to them whiny guys anyway. Um, this, is, um, this is me trying to remember my point. <laughs> that look, you're looking for something can't find it. Kids, kids don't look hard. You know that. Your kid, you remember how they were when they were little, and they didn't get any better when they got to be teens. They think things are going to just jump out at them. And they're, it, you know, there's just, there was a moment when the Lord said, give ye them to eat. And then they all, they just look at him stupid. Then they look at each other stupid. <laughs> and then no doubt in my mind, they look at Judas stupid, because Judas has the bag. Now, his name's not mentioned here, but somebody said, and they said unto him, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Are you telling us to go on this mission and spend that much money on them? <laughs> he said unto them, How many loaves have ye? And that's another moment where they just stood there looking stupid. How many loaves have you? Long pause. And he goes, go and see. <laughs> so they go and see. And when they knew, they say, five and two fishes. I'm sure they said it like that. That's it. Clearly not enough. What do you have? Five loaves. And they're like biscuits, not loaves like we think. Five and fish. They're like two fishes. No, they're two fish. Like a couple of sardines. There's a kid here willing to share his lunch. Five biscuits. Two little fish. Two sardines. And I'm sure their attitude was like, you see? We can't do it. I'm sure that was it. How many loaves have you? Go and see. When they knew, they say five and two fishes. Verse 39 is what I want to draw your attention to. In verse 39 and 40. He commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. The disciples were told, just go break up this crowd into groups. Hundreds and fifties. Give me a group of hundred over here. Give me a group of fifty over there. Now, what is the most efficient way to feed a multitude. It's not about efficiency, but what would be the most efficient way? If you're him and can do anything, how about you just order up manna and let it rain down upon them? It's been done by the same God who fed his chosen in the wilderness. Or the miraculous catch. I mean, after all, Galilee's right there. Just call them up. Call the fish up. Make them flop it up on the shore. And the whole multitude comes down and gets that fish and builds their little fires and Everybody's fed. Or what? Order quail. That's been done. Order the quail. They come flying in at knee height. Can't beat that. Slap, slap, slap. Just slapping quail. Plucking, roast cooking your quail, right? <laughs> I was talking to some kids on, on one occasion about this. And I saw this kid named Ben, Ben Miller. I seen he was looking off while I'm talking. I go, Ben, you got a movie in your head. What are you, what are you thinking? This little kid, Ben, goes, he could have just, because Ben was right, because this is the one who says, light be, and light was. Ben could have just, Ben said, he could have just gone, be full. <laughs> right out of the mind of a little boy, Ben Miller, he could have just said, be full. This wasn't about efficiency, was it? What might we have done? Well, form a line, a multitude, several thousand people. Well, maybe we can get two lines going, both sides of the table, right? The service table. <laughs> but that's not, not what the Lord, the Lord said, go, you guys, go get everybody to sit down. Sit them down. Everybody sit down. Everybody have a seat. Everybody, go sit down, sit down. 
You, you go over there, over here, sit down. And so the disciples, all 12 of them, go about dividing a multitude. Verse 41 says, when he had taken the lo five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and break the loaves, gave them to his disciples to set before them, and the two fishes divided he among all. And they did all eat and were filled. They did all eat and were filled. This was an all-you-can-eat deal. I love a good all-you-can-eat deal, man. I, too much. I, historically, I have a reputation of being an eater. But all you can eat, man. It's, I mean, I, 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 I buffet my body. All you can eat. And, and that, my, Jeanette and I used to travel to pastor's conferences through a travel agency that would get us these cheap tickets from Boston to Vegas. And then we'd, you know, rent a car and drive into Southern California. Back in the old days when we were broke. And we were looking for the cheapest route. But the cheapest route also allowed us to eat like kings because if you go to vegas and you don't gamble you are a winner if you go to vegas and you don't gamble and you go to a buffet and oh those were good days that, that four hour drive to southern california stuffed just <laughs> through the desert i-40 I, good memories <laughs> just driving digesting and checking out the desert No, you can eat deal. I don't think it was that common. Only at a feast would people have that opportunity to do all you can eat. All you can eat, fish sandwiches. And ev everybody was happy. They were all filled. They took up 12 baskets full of the fragments. That's how you know it was all you can eat. Because there's fragments. And the, Lord, the Lord clearly commanded them, go take your basket and, and uh, collect up all the uneaten, all the leftovers. And they did that. Man. Twelve baskets full of the fragments and of the fishes. Verse 44 says, And they that did eat of the loaves were about 5,000 men. There's 5,000 men. There may be 15 or 20,000 people there. That's a lot of people. My question for you to think about this morning is why did he do it like that? Why did he tell them everybody sit down? Why did he not just rain down upon them manna from heaven? I'll tell you why. Why did he divide them into crowds? What happens when you take the chairs, as we have in this room, and you divide them? What do you create? Aisles. What's the, you had this one. <laughs> what is the purpose of aisles? People are the purpose of aisles. You want people to be able to get in the aisles. You want ushers to be able to get down the aisles. I mean, the Lord created the very pathway for bread distributors, and he, in his kindness, involved those men. And what a wonderful thing, man. And just um, it participated in a miracle, doing the simplest thing imaginable. Taking your full basket and go empty it on the people. Now, when your basket's empty, don't stand there and look stupid, <laughs> which I'm sure they did. What do we do now? Go back to him, and he filled their basket again. They didn't have to produce anything. They're not in charge of catching the fish. They're not in charge of growing the wheat. They're not in charge of baking the bread. The simplicity of just bread distribution. How much talent is required to just take your basket and go to him and watch him do a miracle and fill it and then carry your basket back to the multitude? No, no real talent is required. How gracious of him to involve us. He put them right between him and the Sheep without a shepherd, the needy multitude, the hungry mass. He's done the same thing with you and me. He has created for every single one of us avenues. He 
he opens doors no man can close. He puts you in a certain neighborhood. He puts you in a certain job. He puts you in a certain family. It's all a setup. Everything's a setup. <laughs> Everything's a setup, and he is in it all. He even put you in the same, I don't know, avenue as people you don't like or your enemies or difficult people. He's done that. And it is his desire that we should be like him, moved with his compassion upon those sheep without a shepherd. I, dear Christian, I hope you realize today that the Lord's not looking for talent or, or any such thing. He's not looking for talent or genius. He has invited us to, believe it or not, actually be the vessel. Instead of carrying one, we actually are the, we're the basket, in a sense. We are the vessel, and we receive from him, and we just go spill on other people. That life-giving, living water. I don't think I'm oversimplifying anything. In fact, if anything, I've probably complicated it. The genius of Christ, our king, and, and the position that he put those people in, he's invited us there. When you consider Luke chapter 10, that whole story of a certain man, you know, the, we call it the story of the Good Samaritan, probably your Bible publisher does that. Uh, at the top of the page, so you can know what story's on there. The Good Samaritan. There's no Good Samaritans. No good Jews, no good Gentiles, no good Irish. No good Scots. There's no good humans. Are we clear on this? No good Samaritan. All it says in a certain Samaritan. As he passed by, went where he, the victim, was, and he had compassion on him. Love that story. I wish I had time to go over it with you. The thieves. He, the guy fell among thieves. They stripped him, wounded him, and left him. And the Son of God said they left him half dead. Half dead? What are you going to do with that? I put a positive spin on that. Well, at least he's half alive. You look like a cup's half full. He's half dead means he's not all the way dead, and if somebody does something, he might live. What's going to make that guy go from half dead to three-quarters dead to five-eighths dead? Oh, no. Seven-eighths <laughs> to dead. Neglect. Somebody won't help him. He's going to die. That certain Samaritan went to him, had compassion on him. The Lord ends that story. Well, go ye and do likewise. That's what we're called to, dear brothers and sisters. I wish I could hang out with you longer, but I got to go.